بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم By the grace of Allah عز وجل we come together yet again to speak about the hadith uh, of um, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, the popular hadith on an on the subject matter of an And in the previous class, we discussed, you know, in a little bit of detail, the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala So we, you know, dedicated the class pretty much to the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala Now today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll take a look at the actual text of the hadith. So the hadith is always divided up into two different things. There's what they call the isnad, the narration, the chain, that leads up to what is called now the, the, the actual text or the method of the hadith. So there's the body, and then there is an isnad that leads up to the body. So in the previous class, we you know looked at the isnad as well slightly. And I remember I mentioned that uh, the isnad of this hadith is gharib. Right, the the chain of narrations in this uh, hadith is strange, and that means that you know uh, there was one narrator uh, narrating the hadith in a certain part of the chain, and we mentioned that that part was where, right after Umar ibn Khattab, there was or after the Sahabi who was also one, there was three different recurring who tabi'i that were all narrating from one another, okay. And there was no one next to them. And I mentioned that amongst the you know, unique qualities of this hadith also is the fact that the chain is not only gharib, but it also is a special type of gharib where everybody that's narrating from each other, one another, as in uh, partic- specifically speaking, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari, who narrates from Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al-Taymi, who narrates from Alqamah, Ibn Waqqas al Laythi, all of these people are all tabi'i and they're tabi'in and they're narrating from one another. And in that specific level of the chain. So for example, in the level in this from the groups of uh, people that are students of Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al Taymi, there's no one narrating this hadith except Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari. And similarly, from the you know people that are students of Al Qama, there's no one narrating except you know Muhammad ibn Ibrahim at Taymi. But that doesn't uh, undermine the fact that they're all still what tabi'in, because tabi'in are different levels. They're tabi'in that were you know during the lifetime of the Prophet والسلام, but they never got to meet him, and then they met the Sahaba afterwards. And you know, there's uh, those that died uh, not long after that. There's those that came much much later. So. You know, for this reason, there is three different... And sometimes it even goes up to four. Four different tabi'een narrating from one another. Now looking at the text of the hadith, the text of the hadith is as such, it says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, all actions, all actions are based on what? They're based on their intentions. In this particular text of the hadith, in this particular isnad, with this particular isnad uh, that was mentioned by Bukhari and others, the word a'mal, actions, it came plural. The word niyat also came plural. And in other narrations, you will see that the word niyat is singular. Okay? So it's not just not intentions, it's intention. And in other narrations you see the word the word action is singular. So where are all these differences coming from and what exactly is it trying to say? What it's trying to say is that in the in the narration that has both actions and intentions in plural form, what's happening here is that the Prophet is telling you that for every single action there is an intention that goes along with it. So it's what they call in Arabic, مُقَابَلَةُ الْجَمْعِ بِالْجَمْعِ It's when you, uh, when you take jam' 
and then compare it with another jamr. Take a plural and compare it with another plural. So, so what, basically what's being said is that if you pray salat, that has a particular intention. If you pray, if you give zakat, that has its own intention. If you give a sadaqah, that has its own intention. If you fulfill some, a prayer that is fard, that has another intention. If you fulfill a, uh, a prayer that is not fard, rather it's sunnah that has its own intention, and so on, and so forth. So the point of the matter is that every action has what? Has a specific intention. Now here's something that needs to be noted. Um, when the ulama are speak, they speak about uh, the hadith of an niyyah. Usually the ulama, they speak in different ways. And you guys are all students of knowledge. So, the way they speak about the hadith of an is that some ulama will speak of it in terms of the admonition therein. So they will talk about how a person has to what? Purify his intention only for the sake of Allah, so on and so forth. All of these things. Other people, other ulama, will take the same hadith and they'll talk about another aspect and that's the aspect of fiqh. Because niya has a lot, of, lot to do with fiqh. Like for example, you have al-imam al-shafi'i or the shafi'iyah at large. They look at the same hadith. And you have the Hanafiya or al-imam Abu Hanifa. They look at the same hadith and they both translate it in their own manners. So imam Abu Hanifa will come and he will say, innama kamalu al-a'mali bin niyat. Or the Hanafiya will come and they'll say that verily it's only the completeness of actions that occurs through what? Through intention. So what he's trying to say is that you don't necessarily have to have a niya for something like you know al wudu. You don't have to have a certain intention, but for the completeness of this action and for this action to be even more fruitful in the hereafter, you have to have what? An intention, actually intend that I'm purifying myself for the sake of Allah Azza wa so that I can go pray salah. Now, on the contrary, you have Imam Shafi'i or the Shafi'iyyah, they'll say no. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Really doesn't mean إِنَّمَا كَمَالُ الْأَعْمَالِ بِالنِّيَاتِ It really means إِنَّمَا صُحَّةُ الْأَعْمَالِ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, it's nothing but the actual acceptance of the actions that occurs with the intentions. You see the difference? Who understands the difference? So according to the Hanafiyyah, you don't necessarily have to have an intention for an action to be accepted. It's not a condition for you to have an intention, you know, for the action to be accepted. Whereas according to the Shafi'iyyah and the Hanabila and some of the other ulama, you have to have a specific intention for every single action. So, for example, a person wakes up in the morning. So now we're talking about this hadith fiqhiyan in terms of the fiqhi aspects. And we'll get to the other parts as well. A person wakes up in the morning. And naturally he's used. He's used to waking up in the morning and going straight to the sink. It happens to me. I'll attest to it. You know, I wake up in the morning at times and naturally you're used to going, doing what? You know, going and getting up and making wudu. Sahih? But at times you haven't even intended that wudu. Or sometimes you go to the sink to wash your hands. And you don't even think to yourself that I'm making wudu and you end up finding in the middle because you're you know, thinking about something else at that point. And you naturally find yourself cleaning your feet and then you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on, what's going on here? <laughs> and then you realize that you, know, you ended up making wudu. So is this wudu acceptable? Huh? Why is it acceptable? No, he didn't. He didn't yeah, intend to pray. He had no. He had no intention. Where did it come in the middle? You said, "Oh, I forget that I want to do something." Well, raise the hands. Yes. He is waking up in the morning, making a wudu because he has to go for the salah. So he. Okay, forget the morning. You're taking a nap after. Uh, Let's say you got up at 7 o'clock 
uh, get too ready to the office and you just habitually just went to the store. Yeah, it's just habitually, naturally. You just went to, or you just finished eating and you went to go clean your hands. But then all of a sudden you fa- find your feet in the sink as well. So, you know, is this considered a wudu? The answer is no. Because at this particular moment, the individual, this is according to the Shafi'i, yeah, and this is probably the better opinion, that in this particular um, moment, the individual never really intended to have anything. And the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Barely all actions are based on intentions. And if a person doesn't have an intention, then is he going to get the same you know, action? Or is his... Uh, you know, is his... Uh, uh, what they call ritual impurity going to be raised? Hadith. Is it going to be raised? The answer is no. In this particular case, it won't be, it won't be raised. So, uh, and also, another thing that niyyah does for actions is what they call tamyizul ibadat or tamyiz rutab al ibadat. Tamyiz rutab al ibadat. So there's two different, you know, the, the ulama describe niyyah to have two different roles sometimes in fiqh. There's other roles as well. One of the roles is تَمْيِيزُ ibadat بَعْضُهَا عَمْ That it defines ibadat and it sort of like differentiates between two different acts of worship. So you have a person giving zakat, he can't have the intention of praying salah. Which is obvious, right? Which is obvious, but this is something that he, that he does, right? Um, similarly, it also you know, changes the levels. It also differentiates between the levels of the action. So you might have a 500 rao bill that you're donating to a guy on the street that's asking. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, very generous brother. So you might be donating this uh, to a person on the street. Now, had you intended zakat, it would have been zakat. But if you don't intend zakat, what happens? Can you go and later on make your re intend and say format, delete, and then you know reinstall or whatever? That's for safe there. Alhamdulillah, you give sadaq. Type. So there you are. So similarly, salah. <laughs> similarly, salah. Uh, do you intend the same thing in your mind? You don't necessarily have to say it. But in your mind, do you intend the same thing when you are, for example, uh, when you're praying the two sunnah before the Lord, or the four sunnah before the Lord, do you intend the same thing as you would for the actual salah? No. No, of course. So it differentiates between the different levels of actions as well. Some things are wajib, some things are otherwise. Some things are, you know, a mustahab, other things are, you know, wajib. So these are, you know, this is looking at it fiqhi. And as, and as I mentioned in a previous class as well, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah mentioned that, that the hadith of niyyah, it actually, you know, takes effect into over 70 different chapters of fiqh. So it has a lot to do with fiqh here. And the Prophet ﷺ, he then continued, and he said, وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مَا نَوَى And for every person is that which he intended. Okay, for every person, is that which he intended. Now, you know, to sum it up, the ulama, they spoke about these two statements in extensive detail. Whether both of the statements mean the same thing, and the Prophet ﷺ is just trying to, you know, emphasize, or whether each statement has one meaning, and what if... Uh, uh, each statement has a different meaning, and if each statement has a different meaning, what is the two different meanings? So these, you know, things can be found in pages of knowledge. But to sum it all up, some of the scholars, they said both statements mean the same thing. All actions are based on your intentions, and for every person is that which he intended. He said the Prophet ﷺ is just trying to clarify, and he's just trying to uh, emphasize the concept of intention. And other scholars said, no. The first thing is referring to what we spoke about earlier. Okay? The first thing is referring to what we spoke about earlier and how for every action there must be a specific intention. 
Okay? The second thing is referring to the admonition aspect of it. And the fact that every action actually has to be intended for another, none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alone. So, you know, that's where the whole concept of ostentation or adhiyah comes in. That's where this whole concept of adhiyya and how it's impermissible in an Islam and how it can lead a person to being devoid of all ajr from the deed that he's doing. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the hadith Qudsi, He said, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ He said, I am the most... I'm not in need in the least of a person to make shirk with me, to associate a partner with me. So if a person stands up and he's praying, he's praying salat, and he's doing with all due khushur. You know, there's a story of a man, he was standing there praying uh, with all due khushur, just as we said, you know, he's crying, and he's like... By the way, sometimes people get too into khushur and they start going like this. Have you seen that? No, 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 not the hands. I'm not referring, that's a whole other issue. I'm referring to like, you know, just like this. Have you seen, has anyone seen that? Let me stand up. The people watching the video might not see this, but let me just, like they'll go, like this, you see? This is actually a posture that's not supposed to be done. Because what it does is, it does something that, that's not supposed to be there during prayer time. And that's what they call taqawus al dhahr When the back becomes like a, like a bow. Right, your back sort of bends like that. Or like it almost looks like a hunch, hunchback. So that kind of, uh, you know, uh, positioning in salah, it's not supposed to be there. So a person should stand with khushur if he wants to put his face down and that's what he's supposed to be doing. But to make that back like that and you know, in this kind of a thing, that's not necessarily required for a person to do. <laughs> and that's not necessarily appreciated. No, but people do it because they're in that mode at that point, right? Um, in either case, uh, you know, a man was standing and he was praying and you know, with all this khushur, he's crying and there's so tears going down his you know, cheeks and people in the back, they're going... So what are they saying? They're saying, you know, subhanAllah, this guy prays so well, mashallah, tabarakallah, this, that, you know, and this is found in some books, the story. You know, he's playing so well. So though it looks on the outside that this person is doing such a great deed, right then he turns around and he said, by the way guys, I'm fasting as well. So, and this is like, you know, a story mentioned. Wallahu well, alam if it's true or not. But the point of the matter is that, that that's what they call ostentation. He's, he realizes that people are talking about him. So, you know, he's like, subhanAllah, I really am pious, you know. <laughs> I'm the man. <laughs> no. So, so this kind of a thing, you know, is not acceptable. So, some of the scholars, they said the second part of the hadith, wa alaykum salam is actually referring to these uh, aspects of a niyyah, which are also known as al-ikhlas, sincerity. So, you know, the scholars of uh, what they call al-wa'ad, admonition, they would speak about this hadith, wa'adiyyan, in an ad- admonishing manner. Whereas the scholars of fiqh, they talk about it, you know, deriving different fiqh rulings, and the Prophet Wasallam's statements are in a manner that a pers- every person can take what he, he needs from it. Um, there was a story that I wanted to mention, and to keep things short, it's a story mentioned by, you know, uh, Ibn Abid Dunya in his book Makaid al Shaytan, attributes it to Al Hasan, and uh, it's also mentioned by some other, uh, you know, writers, authors over generations. It could be from the Israeliyat, it could be from the Israeli traditions. Uh, Allahu A'lam. But the story is mentioned and has a very good message around it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Hadithu an Bani Israel wa Haraj," that uh, that uh, you know you should uh, you can sp- say the statements of Banu Israel, and there's no problem so long as those statements don't come into contradiction with 
with Al-Islam. Uh, because if they don't go into contradiction with Islam, then we don't necessarily have a problem. And the, the scholars, they divided the uh, traditions into three different categories, but that's another subject. So, the tradition is as such, there was a pious man, a pious slave of Allah Azza wa Jal, and it was probably, you know, from Banu Israel, the slave, if the tradition is an Israeliyah, uh, he was a slave of Allah Azza wa Jal and he would, you know, worship Allah day and night with good intentions. We know that he had good intentions. He would do it for Allah Azza wa Jal. And then, as time went by, he heard, he heard from some people that there is a group of people they started to commit shirk. They're worshipping a tree in place of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because worship is supposed to be directed to Allah alone. So, they started worshipping this tree. So now, someone that is spending his days, his nights, only for Allah Azza wa Jal, when he sees shirk, it really affects him. That someone is taking the due rights of Allah Azza wa Jal and directing them in the wrong direction. So this man... He got up and he knew that you know if he did something in the tree, there could be consequences. He got up, he started walking, walking, walking. And as he walked, you know, he wanted to go there and cut the tree off. As he walked, Iblis appeared for him in the shape of a man. It's a popular story, a lot of you might even know it. Iblis appeared for him in a shape of, the, of, of a man. And then, as the person was walking, he didn't know it was Iblis, you know. Iblis came to him and he said that if you were to go and cut this tree, in If you were to cut this tree, they're gonna go and you know find another tree to worship. So why don't you just go back? You're probably doing better anyways if you go and stay in your house and worship Allah Azza wa Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody will say anything to you. So this man said, no, there's no way. I'm going to have to go and cut this tree. So Iblis, of course, you know, al he doesn't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped. <coughs> the enemy of the believers, Satan. He, you know, he started to literally have a brawl with this individual. As we know, in terms of physical strength, the jinns have probably more power, but they're weaker mentally, and they're, you know, uh, they're more childish and these kind of things. So, now, in terms of, but over here, this is a worshiper. He's not like a bodybuilder or something, you know. So when this brawl occurred, when this fight occurred between Iblis and this man, this man was able to overcome Iblis. Why? We'll find out why. We'll find out why. And then the story continued, you know, he spoke to Iblis. Again, he doesn't know it's Iblis, he appeared in the shape of a man. And the story continued. And the man said, you know, this man, Iblis, he said to this worshiper of Allah Azza wa Jal, you're a poor man. You're a poor man. So if you go home, and you stay at home, they're not gonna bother you, nobody's gonna say anything to you. And I'll come for you every single day, and I'll put two dinars under your pillow. Every single day. So he woke up the first morning. He went home. He said, Khalas, you know what? This guy is gonna give me two dinars. I'm worshipping Allah, I'm not doing something bad. You know? I'm gonna go home. He goes home, and he goes to sleep. In the morning he wakes up, and he finds under his pillow two dinars. So it's like, this is pretty good, you know, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Worshipping Allah, not doing something haram. And here it is, I'm getting two dinars for it now. So he, Iblis is paying him to worship Allah Azza wa Look at the makayid of shaitan. Literally. Because he wants those people to go and commit shirk. This is how beloved shirk is. To Iblis. And then, the story continued. The next day, the man wakes up again. He finds some money under his pillow. And he's like, okay, this is good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. 
He's doing a transaction in Iblis and Alhamdulillah, you know. <laughs> now, the third day he wakes up and he looks under his bed and he, or looks under his pillow and he finds no money. So what do you think happened to him? He's enraged, that's a better word. Yeah. So, he's angry, he's enraged. I like that word. <laughs> he's enraged. He gets up and starts walking. He goes to the tree. He's going to go cut the tree. And as he's going to the tree, lo and behold, there's Iblis right here, in the shape of a man again, and he comes and says, what do you think you're doing? Boy, didn't I tell you I'm going to give you two dollars? He said, you didn't pay me yesterday. No, that didn't occur. <laughs> so, this time along, Iblis came, and right away, the fight started, and Iblis was able to overcome this man at this point. And then the man was shocked. He said, I thought I was powerful. You know, I, I, I felt like, you know, I, you know, when you have a fight with somebody and then there's like, you, it's not like even a 50-50 or you're almost about to win. You really beat the guy. Next time you're pretty confident that you're going to be able to beat the guy. You know, you're going to be able to take care of this dude. Like Hamza, you know, when he was, Umar al-Khattab was walking. He's like, don't worry, I got it guys. So, this fight, Iblis wins. So the man said to him, he said, well, what's going on? I, I beat you so badly last time and now I can't even fight you. He said, the last time that you came, you came solely for the sake of Allah. And this time you came because of your own anger. And because, because of what? Huh? Because of the money. Because of the money. Yes. The, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said about Iblis uh, to a certain story that occurred. He said something good. He said something right, correct. So he said, Sadaqak wa huwa kadhu. He said, He told you the truth and he's a liar. In a true narration, in a sahih narration about another issue. But the Prophet ﷺ told that Sahabi when he came and brought that information to. The Prophet said, He told you the truth whilst he's a liar. So the point of the matter is, you know, he could have been telling the truth because he knows what's right. He knows, he's a alim. That's the reality of it in terms of information. He's been living around. He knows information. He knows people. He knows how you know, things are. He's done a good study of the market basically. So he's been around the block. And that's why Abu Sulaiman al-Darani said, Tuba, Tuba. He said, Jannah is for the person, Jannah is for the person who even one step of his is done for the sake of Allah. Because it's when you do an action solely for the sake of Allah, does the, 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 the athar or the impact of that action continue? And it's only when you do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, does Allah Azza wa Jal help you throughout, you know, concluding that action. And over here is a prime example. This man, when he came walking enraged in Allah's sake, for Allah's sake, and no other reason, even when Iblis came his way, what happened? He was able to overcome it. And this hadith, as I said, or tradition is mentioned by uh, Ibn Abi Dunya in Makayid. Uh, a shaytan. Ibn Abi Dunya had some of the most beautiful books written in the history of Islam. All of them, or a vast majority of them, had to do with what? Huh? No. The vast majority of his works had to do with things that, you know, were pertinent to admonition. So he'd bring things about akhlaq, he'd bring things about wara, taqwa, makayid shaytan, these kind of things, the traps of shaytan. So these were the type of things that he, and he would, what he would usually do is, he would bring different narrations and different traditions of the Salaf, and he was from the early generations himself, uh, and he would write and collect basically, 
these traditions. And you know, with that story being said, we'll stop. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.